That's loud. <laughs> All right, welcome. Um, how many of you were bored during that exercise? Nobody? How many of you enjoyed that? Awesome. Okay, cool. I will do that another time, maybe. Okay, so. At a recent Hackers Hour event, uh, where some developer got together to help each other troubleshoot some problems and help each other learn, I asked the attendees this question. And I'm going to show you some of the responses that I got. This was one of them. This was another. This was another response that I got. And this was another one. So if you can imagine someone who is completely brand new to this field of writing software, and they have this expectation, this idea of what learning is going to be like, and they think, that is going to be a series of stages that you have to get through, sort of like a series of staircases, or like a stage in a video game. When you get to the end of the stage, then you can move on to the next. But when they get there, what they find instead is this, a plethora of entry points. And if they had this reaction, it would not surprise me. Because basically this is a case of information over overload. But there's more. Here is another response that I got. The rate at which new things are coming out that have to be learned is ever increasing. So this is a JavaScript trend graph that I made based on the data in JavaScript Weekly, which is a newsletter curated by Peter Cooper. Um, so on this chart, um, you, you can see some of the most popular technologies used in the field today. And you can clearly see some of them that are trending up and some of them that are trending down. So a couple of things that are trending up clearly is uh, React that's in the dark blue uh, to the bottom of the right there and um, ECMAScript 6 that's the light blue just above React. Um, a couple of things that look to be trending down are uh, Backbone the, in the dark green there. Uh, you can see some of it over here in uh, 2002-2003 and then trending downwards. Another one is CoffeeScript in the light purple. Uh, and jQuery, uh, the, the one in the light orange over here also seems to be trending down. And Node.js in the bright orange, it looks to be trending down, but I would say for this particular case, it's misleading because uh, Peter Cooper has also uh, at some point started uh, a separate newsletter dedicated to Node.js alone. So anyway, so not only is the number of things to learn ever increasing, but the things that you learned yesterday may not even help you tomorrow. And to expect that any one developer can know all of these things but it's kind of like expecting one person to have watched all of the shows that were nominated at the Emmys this year. Um, I had more responses to my question. So this was one of them. And then I had this one. And effectively, these are cries for help. So how do we survive in this ever-changing landscape?
Could it be that we're outgrowing this there's metaphor? Maybe our reality is more like a series of interconnected stairs, maybe? Or like this? Or maybe it's like the big giant stairs all around us? Or maybe it's more like this? So this is a game called uh, The World of Warcraft. Or I think it's the origi originally it was just called Warcraft. And some of you might have played it maybe back in college in your dorm room. So in this game, you're dropped into this unexplored world with very meager resources at the beginning. And most of the world is blacked out. And you can only see the parts of the map that you have explored. Uh, this is a slightly more explored world, and you can see that more parts of the world the, on the top left here are, have been light, light, lighted up. And um, you can also see that some of the parts are grayed out, and those are the parts you have seen, but you just don't have, currently have eyes on it right now. So that I think that this is a helpful way to think of learning as exploring a brand new world. I think this is a helpful way to think about learning in the midst of all of this vastness of knowledge that we face today. And here are some of the ways in which learning is similar to this. So everybody has to start somewhere with meager resources. The more you explore, the more you know. And if you get stuck somewhere, like uh, if there was a river that you could not cross, or there was a really st enemy stronghold that you, you could not take down, you can always explore elsewhere. But you can always come back to it when you have, later, you have more resources. And in a way, this model kind of even out the playing field, because no matter who you are and where you are in your journey, the big picture always looks like this. This is the part that you don't know. Uh, this is the part that you know. The amount that you know is infinitesimal compared to the amount of things that you don't know. So in a sense, we're all newbies and we're all in the same boat. So if you need to survive with these meager resources, you need to become a damn good explorer. <laughs> and schools will not get you there. Schools are not enough. Because schools cannot deal with this constant influx of information and this rate of change. It's not that you should not go to school, but while you're in school, if you do go to school, you want to focus on acquiring the skills that you need in order to be able to cut the cord and be able to continue learning on your own. So what makes a good explorer? Well, whereas most people normally stick to what they know, explorers do the opposite. They gravitate towards the unknown. And also, and, and so, a great way of learning to become a better explorer is by getting into the habit of asking questions and also making sure that you get them answered. An easy way of making that actionable is by keeping a log of questions. Log a question in a notebook every time that a that a question pops up into your head. When you're working on a project, when you're learning a new thing, when you're reading a tutorial, when you're reading a book, when you're uh, watching a talk, whatever, whenever. Whenever something feels out of place, weird, funny, confusing, iffy, scary, that is a sign that it's probably a good time to write down a question. And sometimes it might be hard to articulate the question, but power through that and it'll get easier with practice.
Don't forget to get those questions answered, though. <laughs> Set aside time for them and uh, sort of view it as a to-do list that you, you need to go over and over and over again. And when you get a question answered, you've leveled up. So you can check that off. And this is actually a good answer to this question that we had earlier. Keeping a question log will help you fill in your knowledge gaps. Another good way of orienting yourself towards the unknown and to explore and to explore the things that you don't feel comfortable with is this productivity hack that I stole from Tim Ferriss. So this hack works like this. Write down three to five things that you feel most anxious or uncomfortable about. And then look at each item and ask these two questions. Number one, if this were the only thing I accomplished today, would I be satisfied with my day? And number two, will moving this item forward make all of the other items on this list unimportant or easier? That is a great way to prioritize what you have to do to learn. Let's talk about focus. How can you focus admits all of this information? Our working memory is limited and can hold only about a handful of things, of concepts at any one time. And as programmers, and you, I'm, I'm sure you know this, working memory is an especially precious resource. So it doesn't really help to have all of this stuff on high blast. To learn effectively, we have to somehow be able to take this blast, blasting fire hydrant and reduce it down to a series of drips. So that means isolating, isolation. We have to learn one thing at a time because we have to find the right difficulty level for you. So for example, if you're going to learn React, do not also try to learn Flux, Redux, ES6, Babel, Gulp, and Webpack all at the same time. Start from scratch. Favor starting from scratch to over using a template or a uh, template project generator or something like that. Uh, this way you know exactly what ingredients you're putting into the mix. So this is how I like to uh, start messing around with React, for example. Uh, I would just create a new empty directory. I would create an index.html file inside of it. <coughs> and uh, this is the most current uh, React tutorial on their website. And luckily it's got this uh, this bit of HTML that you can simply use in your index HTML to bootstrap a project. So that's really all you need. It's just one file. And then you plug in the first piece of the example code there, and then you're off and running, basically. And you can start messing with this code. And there's no need to be fancy and go to ES6. Just use the classic ES5 syntax. Uh, unless, of course, if you're already familiar with ES6, then by all means, go for it. Again, find the right difficulty level for you. And you can go actually go a step further and to simplify it even more if you don't use JSX, um, because that's actually optional. So this is actually how I, the first time I learned React, I decided, well, I didn't care particularly for the JSX syntax. Uh, by the way, the JSX syntax, I mean this, this use of the tags inside of the JavaScript, which requires a special preprocessor. Um, so I didn't care for that, so I just learned React without using that syntax and just used the pure JavaScript counterpart instead. Once you finish a tutorial or two and have a couple of toy projects under your belt, then you're ready to move on to Flux. The goal here is to take information in small drips. 
and to avoid this. When you're in a market that is too volatile for your comfort, you want to latch onto the most stable currencies. So if you know there's a set of skills that will always be useful to you, regardless of the flavors of the day, you want to double down on them. But how do you know what those skills are? Well, don't worry, I'm going to tell you now. Touch typing, very underrated. Um, if you're not, how many of you are not touch typists? Not fluent touch typists? Okay. Huh? Touch typing means you type without having to look at your keyboard? Okay. Yeah, so if you're not a touch typist, that's a big win to learn it now. So I would strongly encourage that. And if you're just starting, I would encourage you to take a look at Dvorak and Comac as alternative keyboard layout options. Debugging and troubleshooting. Source control, using the command line. How to ask questions online. Object-oriented programming. Functional programming. Refactoring your communication skills task management, and I mean, this is not an exhaustive list, but, oops, but the point is, oops, the point is that um, this is a list of skills that I know that if you invest your time and energy into learning any, any of these well, it's very unlikely that we, you would have wasted your time. And, uh, Debugging is an especially important one, which I will come back to later. Oops, I messed up my slides, sorry. Okay. So, um, embracing your mistakes is something I think that's really important to keep in mind when you're studying. So back when I was working for the Mechanical School of Engineering for Georgia Tech, I made a mistake which caused one of the coworkers I worked with to have to redo some of her work. And she was furious. She, she barked at me. And I was taken aback. That was not, that was not an environment really conducive to learning. It turns out that experienced developers make just any mistakes as junior developers. They just recover from them faster. I credit this quote to uh, Kylie Stradley and her brilliant talk at uh, RailsConf. So everyone can just mellow out about making mistakes because we're all in the same boat. In fact, I will argue that it's not just okay to make mistakes, it's actually better to be making mistakes when you learn. Uh, there's actually some research done by some scientists that shows that trying first and then failing to, to retrieve the answer is actually helpful to learning something. So in this article, in one of the studies that was mentioned, a group of students were asked to take some reading comprehension tests. And they were separated into two groups, the experimental group and the control group. In the control group, the, the students would do a normal reading comprehension test. They would read an article, and then they would answer some questions about the article to see how much they understood about the article. In contrast, the students in the experimental group they were made to answer the question before they read the article. And then they read the article, and then they would answer the same questions again. And what they found was that the students in the experimental group did better. How much better? Around 10%. Okay, you might say, well, 
is not that much. Is it really worth it? Because you know, it takes some effort, right, to have to make a mistake and then recover from it. So okay, let me try another line of argument. Students who are taught not to make mistakes, they obey. They're taught to always stick with the prescribed method, even if it doesn't work. Here, my daughter thought it would be funny to stop in the middle of the racetrack. And being the responsible adult that I am, I decided to stand there and, and just observe. And these two kids are just stuck behind her, and they have no recourse but to just wait there Students who are encouraged to take chances are not afraid of making mistakes. When they see new opportunities, new ways to solve problems, they take them. These kids are the off-roaders. And guess what? You are going to need those off-roading skills. Because in our profession, you can't always count on being able to stay on the happy path. So what does that mean for you in your studies? When a tutorial seems too easy, that's a red flag. That doesn't mean, when you complete a tutorial, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have successfully learned the concept. So I propose to you this rule. The, I call it the fail something rule. If you make it through the entire tutorial or lesson or course without failing at something even once, you fail. So uh, how, to prevent, how to prevent that? Well, one way to try to make more mistakes is by doing something more open-ended. So come up with some ideas of your own uh, and ask questions that you don't know the answers to. Another approach that you could take is to uh, follow a tutorial, but take detours while you're doing that tutorial. So you're using the tutorial as a guardrail, and in er invariably when you're reading through the material, your questions are going to pop up in your mind. And that's a good time to write it down in your question log. And um, take a detour. What, what, I wonder what would happen if I changed that, if I deviated from the tutorial in this way. So do that. Do that and find out what happens. And when you're done with that detour, come back, go a little further, and take another detour. Again, find the difficulty level that is right for you. And ask questions about things that you're unsure of. Be a damn good explorer. Okay, now you might say to me, Toby, you make it sound so easy. But getting stuck trying to get something to work is really painful. So how do we recover from mistakes when we make them? So that is the realm of debugging and troubleshooting. Now, there are other types of mistakes other than bugs, but bugs that are caused by small, low-level mistakes are so common and such a big source of frustration for learners that I have paid special attention to this problem. So much so that I have started a project with the aim of providing an effective means of teaching these skills to up-and-coming developers. Uh, debug school is still under construction, but right now you can sign up to be notified when the door is open. I'm going to talk about one of the most important concepts that I cover in my lessons, and that is the scientific method. Sometimes when I help somebody debug a problem, they say to me, that's not possible. That just cannot possibly happen and they will show me that it cannot possibly happen because they've already verified this, and they've already verified this, they've already verified that, that, and that, 
as if they have found a smoking gun that proves that they were right, and therefore the computer must be wrong. And while computers have been known to be drunk at times, a much more probable explanation that is that this is simply a case where a strongly held assumption is mistaken. When we write code, we make assumptions about the code we write. Uh, this is natural and this is ne very necessary because unless we make assumptions, we cannot plan. And in case you didn't know, coding is an activity that requires a lot of planning. However, if you're debugging, things did not go according to plan. If something defies logic, that means that one of your assumptions are wrong. And you need to suss out which one of those it is. The same way that you might want to suss out who is the mole in a spy agency, you need to get suspicious, paranoid even. Trust no one, not even yourself. Because the mole has a good track record at deceiving you so far. So what makes you think you can get away, what makes you think you can outsmart it in the usual way? Instead, we'd better have something more scientific. So when you encounter a bug, we're going to look at it, our program as if it was some kind of phenomenon, a sort of black box that behaves in a certain way, something that we don't completely understand yet, but we're ready to learn more about through scientific investigation. And this is the recipe for the scientific method. First, you ask a question, and you form a hypothesis trying to explain why. You form a prediction based on that hypothesis what would happen if I did something specific. And then you perform an experiment in order to test that prediction. You do an analysis to, um, you look at what happened in the experiment and you try to understand why. And if the loop isn't closed, if it's necessary, then you go back to step one and do it all over again. Come up with a new question. and do the same thing to try to answer it again. So it turns out that we as a species are actually pretty good at this, almost. We will very instinctively do something that's very close to the scientific method, but with one difference. Let me show you what usually happens. So first we would ask a question, then our brain automatically comes up with some kind of hypothesis. Then we'll come up with a prediction. And then we skip doing the experiment. And then we reaffirm to ourselves that we got it right. So the moral of the story is, don't skip step four. Okay, the next strategy is a bit of a trick to help you understand a, a concept better and faster, and that is juxtapositioning. What is juxtapositioning? Well, it is when you put two otherwise unrelated concepts together side by side. Uh, Mashups are juxtapositions. Analogies are juxtapositions, juxtapositions too. And I might say, Juxtapositioning is to concepts as, is, as a blender is to fruit. And, and that very sentence that I just said is also a juxtaposition. So that to the left is my son Marty, and then to the right of him is Shakira, multi-platinum recording artist. Uh, Marty had been familiar with Shakira's music because 
she is on his mom's playlist. But he didn't feel particularly strong about her music. However, that changed one night when at a restaurant we heard a band play uh, one of Shakira's songs. After that night, he asked for this song every time that we were in the car, and he asked for it to be put on repeat all the time. That is the power of the juxtaposition. This is a model of learning that I stole from the book, Why Don't Students Like School? And in this model, learning is the interaction between three things, the long-term memory, that's the box on the bottom. The working memory, that's the box on the top right. And the environment, that is the hexagon over there. The material that is being presented to you is being presented to you in the environment. And assuming that you're paying attention, it goes into your working memory. Now, the tricky thing is to get that thing from your working memory to go into your long-term memory. And it turns out that the key thing that has to happen is to engage your brain in thinking activity, um, in thinking about the subject in question as it relates to the knowledge you already have in your head, in your long-term memory. In other words, the stuff that's in your long-term memory, the bottom box there, is sticky, like chewed bubblegum. So if you learn, want to learn the new material well, if you want it to stick, you have to figure out a way to get that pre-chewed bubblegum to bubble up from this bottom box up into that top box here and start grabbing stuff. You want it to stick to the new stuff. And I posit that maybe the best way to do that is by juxtapositioning something that you know well with the thing that you're trying to learn. So in my son's case, he is already familiar with the song already. But hearing that song in a new context, in a, rest in a restaurant, it's a different band, it's a different singer, that allowed him to juxtapose, juxtapose the version of the song he knew with the new version of the song that is, he is hearing. And I have used this concept to learn to sing a Portuguese song that I'm obsessed with, even though I know zero Portuguese. Um, I would first listen to my favorite version of this song uh, many, many times, and I would try to sing along with it. Um, once I started to be able to sing some of the parts, I would switch to listening to a different recording of the same song, um, preferably one that has a slower tempo. Um, and then after a while of doing that, I would juxtapose on top of that, uh, actually reading the Portuguese lyrics in a written form while I'm singing along with the song. So what I find is that I get something new from each new juxtaposition. Uh, there's something, every time I do one of these things, there is something that I can use from them. There's something I can use from each of them that makes it easy for me to remember different aspects and different parts of the same song. I have also used this concept for learning programming languages. Uh, when I was learning the programming language Rust, I decided to write a little command line program that would allow a beginner to very easily deploy static websites using the GitHub Pages service. I then also decided to rewrite that same program in Haskell. And this exercise helped me to very quickly identify the weaknesses that I had in Rust and vice versa, the, the weaknesses that I had in, Rust, in Haskell. So in fact, just this positioning is another effective way of filling up your knowledge gaps. 
how can you apply this concept? Well, the formula is actually very different. It's doing something that's the same but different. Same but different, same but different. So here are some ideas for you. You can have the same concept explained in different ways for you. You can get different, for example, you can read different blog posts about the same concept. You can read uh, different book chapters that are also covering that same concept. You can watch different talks about that same concept. You can do different tutorials about that same concept. And you can do video course lessons about that same concept. You can also do different code exercises that are related to the same concept. You could take a problem that you know well, um, maybe you know in a previous job you're in the restaurant business. Well, do something that's related to the restaurant business and write it in a program. If you're an artist, you can use your unique skills to teach others programming. You can rewrite a program in a language that you already know and contrast that with the one that you're learning. And you can rewrite an app in a different programming style, a different framework, or a different language. Vice versa, you can write a different type of app using the same programming language. So some of some examples of this is with PhoneGap, you can use HTML and JavaScript to write a native app. And uh, with Electron and Node WebKit, you can use this same technology to write desktop applications. You can also use the same language, but on a different side. You know what side I'm talking about. You can re-implement, you can re-implement a library or a concept in a different language and a framework. And actually, you see this a lot in the open source world. And I personally have done this a lot. It's like, oh, that seems like a cool concept in Ruby or Haskell or whatever. I'm going to re-implement that in JavaScript or something. So you get sort of this proliferation of open source libraries that are just re-implementations re of a concept that's found in another programming language. Wait, there's more. There's another way of using uh, juxtapositioning. Um, you can use juxtapositioning via negation, by eschewing something that is already in your repertoire. So an example of that is uh, you could write OO code without using inheritance. I, that, that's something I have personally done. So far, so good. Uh, you can write code without using any objects. Vice versa, you can write code without using any functions. You can even write code without using any if statements, if you can believe that. Um, you can write code without using jQuery. You can write a web app without using a backend. There's tons of ideas. Go crazy. I've just give you, given you the tip of the iceberg here. OK, let's talk about teaching what you learned back to others. Since Roman times, we have known that teaching is actually a really effective way to learn. And evidently, we still know that today because um, a couple of days ago, I heard this said by Kyle Simpson at his workshop. And this is called the protege effect, which says that the best way to learn is by teaching. And there's this guy named John Paul Martin. He was a teacher in Germany in the 1960s. And uh, he developed this teaching method called Learn and charge their heart. Oh, I'm butchering that. Which means <laughs> learning by teaching, where students are asked to prepare and give lessons to each other in the classroom. And this method, although it requires more work both on, both on the part of the teachers and the students, it worked really well in terms of teaching. 
In fact, it's been shown that if students were told even that they will have to teach each other um, afterwards before they learn the material that they have to learn, they learn better. It's like they don't even actually have to teach each other. They just have to think that they have to. And just by thinking that, they will learn better. So along the same line of research, a computer program called Betty's Brain was made. Betty is a teachable agent, an AI that you can teach concepts to. And it has been shown in this research that students who teach concepts to Betty after they learn the subject matters, they do better than the students who don't. But when I looked at this, the thought that came to my head was this. It's not like we have a shortage of learners here. Learning is the last thing that we need to outsource to a computer, right? There are actually real people that you can teach to. So, if you want to take advantage of this strategy, uh, become a teacher. Go seek out meetups in your local area. Uh, speak and mentor others. I help organize the Atlanta JavaScript meetup here. And uh, that's a good place to find help and uh, help others. Um, you can also do the same online. Uh, in IRC chat rooms, in our area, there's the Tech 404, where um, a lot of learners and uh, mentors hang out. There's also this community called Code Newbies, which is a flourishing community where the people there are supportive and everybody is helping everybody learn. Also, blog. Blogging is one of the best ways to solidify your understanding of the concepts that you're learning right now. And another great way to uh, elucidate something that you know is by making screencasts, especially for coding. And you don't have to be an expert in order to teach. Um, in fact, beginners have an advantage over experts because there's this effect called the curse of knowledge. Um, experts, they take for granted the, the ideas that they know by heart. And those, those things they know subconsciously. So they don't, they, they don't want to consider the possibility that other people may not know those things already. So as a result of that, they skip over a lot of material that otherwise would become knowledge gaps in, in other people that they're trying to teach. So beginners actually have the potential to be better teachers. Let's see how much time we got. Okay. Okay, I want to come back to this world view um, of thinking of learning as exploring a brand new world. And the idea that learning is a constant process, that, that we can never stop learning. Um, is, is this a curse or is this a blessing? So, so in one day, I realized that um, that lifetime, lifetime, lifelong learning is sort of the key to getting lifelong happiness. And you have probably heard this from other people, and there are different ways of arriving the, at this conclusion. But the way that I arrived at it is, I read this book. Uh, this book is called Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience. Uh, in this book, the author talks about this 
state of mind that he calls the flow state. The flow state is when all of your attention is focused on doing one thing, when time stands still, and there you have no distractions whatsoever. And like Michael Jordan talks about being in the zone, and he's when he's in the zone, he sees the basket, and it's like this giant big old bucket that he's just tossing stuff into. Um, so that that is the flow state, and. What researchers have found is that people are the happiest when they're within this flow state, when they're operating under this flow state. And the thing about the flow state is if, if you operate in this, under this mindset, you will skill up very, very quickly because you're at a really, really high level of efficiency in terms of learning. And if, you, if you've done one thing, if you have achieved one skill in a flow state, chances are it, it won't be very long before you sort of level up. And then that the same skill won't be interesting to you anymore. So you actually won't be able to achieve the same flow state by doing that same thing you're going to have to level up if you want to be able to reach that same flow state again. So, obviously, then the answer to that is learning. If you want to keep having these flow states, well, then you had better keep learning. Learning more and more and more and more and more. And thus, lifelong, lifelong learning. So that's what I wanted to leave you with today. Thank you.